Do you want to fetch data faster from a REST API? In this video I will show to you how you can parallelize API calls using notebooks in Max Fabric. So stay tuned. Welcome to the video, my name is Alexia and on this channel I cover Max Fabric and Azure related topics. In this video we are continuing our journey with Max Fabric data engineering and today we are covering parallelizing API calls with notebooks. In the previous episode in this series I covered the basic principles how to fetch data from an API using a notebook in Maxed Fabric. If you missed that episode the link can be found in the description. In this episode we are going to expand that topic and parallelize those API calls in order to fetch that data faster. Since parallelization allows us to do multiple API calls simultaneously which can drastically improve our processing time. In this example we are going to use concurrent futures library in Python to do the parallel processing and it is good to know that there are other ways of doing parallel processing in notebooks as well. Like using Spark user defined functions or UDFs that we are not going to cover in this episode. Also the notebook I will be using in this video can be found by clicking the link in the description. But now let's hop into fabric and check out how to parallelize API calls. Before we get started with building parallelized API calls, let's just cover a few basic principles that are good to understand when working with parallel processing. Let's start with this very simple Python function that takes in a value and then prints out that value here. And we can call that function using this string ABC here. Let's run this cell and let's see what happens. And here we can see that we just printed out processing ABC, so our function worked fine. Next let's expand this topic a bit. Here we have almost the same function we had in that previous cell, but now I have also imported this time library here and I'm using the sleep function there to sleep 1.5 seconds every time this function runs. Now we could try to run this function here in a for each loop and pass this list of letters to that loop. And with this logic we would process these list items one by one and wait 1.5 seconds each time we process each item. We could imagine that these are some API endpoints or something that we would like to process and in this case we are processing them one by one. So we wait until the previous one has been completed and then we run the next one. Let's try to run this cell and let's see what happens. And we can see that we start to print those values here. Processing A, processing B, processing C, etc. So we are running these now one by one. In the next example here we are trying to do the same thing but now in parallel. So instead of running these list items one by one we would run them in parallel. Let's break down what is happening in this cell. I'm importing this thread pool executor from this concurrent futures library. This concurrent futures library in Python is this kind of a library that allows us to do parallel processing in Python. It has many tools for running parallel processes and this thread pool executor is only one tool in that arsenal that we can use. But in my opinion this is a very good choice for doing API calls. And it uses processor threads to run those parallel tasks. And here I have an example how we are going to use that thread pool executor. So this is the way we would call it. So with thread pool executor and then we define the amount of workers that will be used. So basically this amount of workers defines how many parallel processes we can have or what is the maximum amount of parallel processes that we have. So in this case I'm defining there to be two. So in that case we will run two processes parallel. And with this code here we are executing those parallel processes. So basically we are submitting this function parallel testing for these parallel processes and then submitting that parameter value that is expecting and getting that parameter value from our list there. And then we are saving the return information that comes from our parallel processes to this futures object here. And now let's run this and let's see what happens. And let's pay attention to things that this is printing. And as we saw we always ran two of these same time because we defined max workers to be two. And that's why we executed these in batches of two. If we would modify this to be three we would execute this in two batches since we would process ABC in one batch and after that once they are done we would process DAF. Let's run this again and let's demonstrate that. And let's pay attention to print. And there we can see the first batch and there was the second batch. 
And when building these parallel processes, this max worker count is one of the most important concepts to understand. Because the process will be heavier, more parallel processes you have. So you have to consider what is the CPU you are using to run this and what kind of limitations there could be when you are running this process in parallel multiple times at the same time. In this next example, I want to cover another very important topic with parallel processes, that is error handling. And here I have modified this code a bit and added this value error when we reach the value D there. So here the process would fail when we run into that D value. And let's see what happens when we try to run this code. And let's run this and now it is running again in batches of 2 and ABC and there is DC. And FA and we can see that we didn't get an error message when we ran this and now let's try to understand why we didn't get that error message when we ran this when we are submitting those parallel processes to this executor we are not caring about what happens after that and we don't have any error handlings so with these parallel processes it is important to gather information that comes out from the parallel processes and then do some handling based on that we can do that error handling in a couple of ways. One way would be to check every process after it has run, did we have errors, and then proceed to the next process. Other way would be that we just let them all run, and after we have run them all, we just go through them and see if there were any errors. And that is the method I usually prefer. And here in the next example, I have modified the code a lot and added that error handling there. So here we are giving a return value every time our parallel testing function runs and we are just saying completed and some value. And then we have that same error here once we reach the D letter there. After we are done with the processing, we are going to iterate over these futures or these processes that we ran with this code. And for that we can use this as completed function that can be found from the concurrent futures library. And this basically just iterates over those futures or processes that we run there. And then we are checking did we have any errors there? So we are getting the results out from our processes and then we are checking did we have any exceptions there? And if we had any errors or failures there, we will add that to this failed array there. And if we had any failed processes, we will print out those failed processes and then raise a value error so we get a failure to this notebook. And now let's try to run this and let's see what happens. And now it is running and we will execute them again in patches of two. And there we can see that we managed to execute this, but we can see that this entire notebook cell failed and it says these failed with these error messages and there we are printing that information that D failed. And here we are raising also that value error there so that our notebook will fail and our processing won't continue further in this notebook or in our data pipeline. And now we have gathered the understanding about those parallel processes. And now we can move to the most juicy part of this video and parallelize API calls. And for that API calls, we are going to use the code that we created in the previous video, where we fetch this Pokemon and Berry data from this Pokemon endpoint. And then we are going to write that data to our lake house. I'm not going to explain in great detail what this code does, since I already did that in the previous episode in this series. But for demo purposes, let's run this code and let's see how does this process those endpoints. And now it is running and it starts with the Pokemon endpoint. And we can see that it's processing it very fast and going through the pages in that endpoint. And after it completed the Pokemon endpoint, it started to fetch data from that Berry endpoint. But we can see that this process didn't happen in parallel, since it first processed that Pokemon endpoint and then it processed that Berry endpoint. And now we would like to modify this code so that it would process those endpoints in parallel without processing them one by one. But before we do that, I would like you to know that I spent a ton of my free time creating these videos for you. And that's why I would like you to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more Max Fabric data engineering content. It doesn't cost you anything and I would highly appreciate that. But now let's continue with the video.
and here I have a code that would run those endpoints in parallel. Basically, I have wrapped the logic to this process endpoint function. And in this previous example, we just ran these endpoints in this for each loop. And we would need to wrap this into this function in order us to call this function in that parallel processing executor. And to this process endpoint function, I have added to this error handling functionality by using this try and accept functionalities here, so that we can do that error handling that I showed you previously and checked did we have any errors in those parallel processes when we ran them. And here we are doing that actual parallel processing and the max worker count will be actually the length of our endpoint list, which will be two in this case since we have Pokemon and Berry endpoint. And after we have run those endpoints in parallel using this executor submit function, then we are going to check if we had any errors there during the processing. And after that, we are going to have that error handling that will actually fail this notebook cell if we had any errors and draw some messages about those error messages. And now we are ready to run this code. And let's run this and let's see what happens. And we can see that we are running those endpoints at the same time. And we can see that it's running really fast and we can see that everything went fine and we didn't have any failures during processing. And we can see that all berry pages were processed and all Pokemon pages were processed. And for demo purposes we can modify this code a bit to throw an error message. For example add one extra letter to this API URL and let's see what happens if we run this now. It should fail fast. And there we can see that we get an error message that we had some issues with the HTTP connection. Also, when building these parallel processes and fetching data from an API, it is always a good thing to think, are there any limitations on API side that you could, for example, do too many calls to the API and cause some problems. So it is probably good to check API documentation or contact the API owners to know about these limitations and how they could affect your data pipeline. Also, here we are processing those endpoints one by one. Of course, you could modify this code and do it in a way that you would process each call in parallel and maybe increase the parallelization. But that is something that you can try on your own. Also, it is good to know that this concurrent futures library runs in the driver node when you're using Spark. So it doesn't really utilize those worker nodes at all. So you would have to think about what is the size of your driver node in your cluster. Since the driver node is going to be the limiting factor how many processes you can run in parallel. If you're using Spark and you would like to utilize more of those worker nodes that you have in your cluster for that parallel processing, then you would need to probably use Spark user-defined functions or UDFs that I'm going to cover in a later episode. But for now it is good to know that there are other options for doing this parallel processing than just this concurrent futures library. Even though I think this is one of the best options to use and it is one of the cheapest if you don't have a massive cluster to do a parallel processing logic. Now you should have an understanding how you can do parallel API calls using notebooks in Muxed Fabric. If you'd like to learn more about Fabric, check out this video next. Now I thank you for watching and see you in that video.